Have you seen that tower on the strip all lit up? You can see it for miles. So it happened that the battle over Caruthers Canyon concluded with a decisive victor, the town of Silverwood. The actions of three outsiders, the Courier, Russell, and Glanton, had irrevocably changed the canyon. With their tribe decimated by Glanton, the remaining sand wolves fled Caruthers Canyon, forever traumatized by the destruction of their kin. Though few in number, the survivors swore an oath to enact vengeance on Glenn and the courier who failed to stop him. With the canyon securely in NCR hands, Silverwood quickly developed into a regional hub for mining and commerce. Settlers from across California flocked to the town, eager to share in its prosperity. Civilization had made its mark. Within a few years, most of the townsfolk had never heard of the Sand Wolves, though a few would never forget. Eventually, word of a great duel in Utah reached town. Travelers said the courier had died, then rose again to fight the man in black. The people of Silverwood prayed for the courier, though they feared the worst. Unable to overcome his inner demons, Vickers succumbed to cam abuse not long after his meeting with the courier. He would be buried in an unmarked grave near Friesland. Slain in the bowels of Chola Mountain, Endershot's piece of the arms trade would die with him. The Van Graffs quickly moved to secure his clients and solidify their position in the Mojave. The disillusion with their lot in the Mojave, Finley remained loyal to the Khans, if only out of respect to his late friend Chance. In his private moments, he hoped to live long enough to see the Khans revitalized, mercifully destroyed. Reveling in the defense of Silverwood, Charlie's bravery was lauded by the townspeople of Silverwood. With his newly arrived service records in hand, Charlie immediately became a respected figure in Silverwood. As the previous sheriff had abandoned his office, a collection of citizens urged Charlie to run. Though initially hesitant, he eventually agreed and won in a landslide victory. Hobo Charlie was no more. He was now Sheriff Charlie. Emboldened by the courier's advice, Briggs sold his shares in the saloon and headed west. His unique cinema-themed saloons quickly flourished and grew into a popular chain, bringing Briggs wealth and recognition. He would use his newfound wealth to finance dozens of films, all of them directed by Albert Breach. Unfortunately, while visiting the set of Bride of the Death Claw, Briggs would be decapitated by a vertebrate rotor in a freak accident. Mourned by hundreds in the growing film industry, he would be immortalized in a bronze statue outside Albert Breach Studios. Shrewdly avoiding the battle with the Legion, this cat continued servicing throngs of enthusiastic clients. Unfortunately, the piece came at a price. As more families moved in, ordinances against prostitution eventually compelled her to move on. After leaving town, she traveled to New Reno, where she was rumored to thrive as a fluffer in the pornographic film industry. Despite his urge to leave office, Mayor Brandon heeded the courier's advice and stayed the course. Despite his newfound religiosity, Brandon had acquired a reputation for cowardice and corruption, and was promptly voted out of office. Eventually, he published a memoir of his career. Though the book was a commercial failure, it endured as required reading for students. Brandon would live out the rest of his days in obscurity, dying penniless and alone. Moved by the courier's encouragement, Sullivan moved to Reno and opened his own gym. Though he initially struggled, Sullivan eventually gained recognition for his skill as a coach and would be sponsored by the Bishop family. He would go on to train some of the most successful prize fighters in New Reno. Avoiding the battle for Silverwood, 
Parmley resumed his duties as a courier, delivering parcel across the southwest. Parmley didn't think about the courier until he heard rumors of a legendary duel somewhere in the mountains of Utah. He heard that the courier had emerged from the grave to fight a man worse than any other. Some said he fought the devil himself. Hearing this, Parmley decided the lifestyle of a courier didn't suit him anymore. He would go on to marry and settle in Redding. With the blood of the sand wolves dripping from his blade, Glanton and his gang set out for new frontiers. Travelers spoke about him in hushed tones, mentioning distant tribes scalped, whole villages destroyed. Others said he went to Utah. They spoke of an unholy alliance, then whispered another name, Marco. What began as a simple bounty job had grown into a powerful experience for Russell, one which would forever alter his identity and outlook. Having grown to trust the courier, Russell learned that the bonds he found in the Desert Rangers were not entirely unique. This new friendship, forged through shared hardships, revived a feeling he hadn't felt in a decade. Hope for the Mojave Wasteland and himself. Though Russell would remain haunted by the massacre of the Sand Wolves, he found peace with the demise of his former owner, Titus Vulcanus. Russell hoped he would be able to repay the courier somehow, though he suspected it wouldn't take long. He knew that their greatest challenges were waiting in the Mojave Wasteland and in distant lands. Because war, war never changes.